Well, I appreciate each and every one of you being here and uh, pressing on in the things of God. Summer comes, and sometimes we like to go and do other things. I understand that, but I appreciate faithfulness. Amen? As what Pastor Al said, he said he appreciated the fact that we've stood here as faithful people, and he likes to work with faithful, faithful people. And uh, we thank the Lord for that. Praise God. And I just thank the Lord for each and every one that has stood with us all these years. As most of you know, we have shared a couple of weeks ago a message on Christian unity, the revelation of Christian unity. And uh, Brother Joe was watching the, the message there tonight. And I told him on the phone the other day we were chatting together. I said, I give you permission to be a little upset with me. So he didn't know that I was going to talk about him and Danny, and nor did I, actually. Uh, but uh, as I was talking about uh, the aspect of uh, unity in diversity, I began to share the story about how Joe and I met and how he came and prayed over my feet and, and uh, how we've been walking together over these last 20 years and uh, uh, how Danny has been such a blessing too and it's really been through Joe's ministry to his brother that Danny has raised up, you know. And then when Jackie first came, started coming uh, over, uh, he got together with Danny uh, down in the f factory there and jammed away with the guitars a bit and that kind of loosened Danny up a little bit to, to play the guitars and to get to going on that. So that was, that was great. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Well, um, that was the first half of, of the message that I wanted to share. How many of you know coins usually have two sides to the heads and tails? <laughs> well, uh, w the revelation of Christian unity uh, was a message mostly about the importance of recognizing uh, unity in diversity, not unity in uniformity. That's why I shared the story about Joe and I. He, as from a Catholic background, and myself from a, a non-Catholic background, that we can work together and do the works of God together, pray together, and uh, we've done some great things together, and I've appreciated Joe's support, uh, not only financially, but being here with us on Thursday nights and uh, from time to time on Sundays as well, Sunday evenings. But uh, we've, we recognize that each other's ability to flow and to go and to do what Joe has to go and do what he has to do. And uh, from time to time, I get to take part in that a little bit. <laughs> Some of the charismatic Catholic uh, folks, like Sister Gloria and some of the others that have been amongst us over the years, we've had great time ministering together. And as I said in the message, then I shared that, and it's on the website, on the video on the website um, that Brother Curtis has put up there for us, and I thank Curtis for that, that uh, really it's what God has done in my relationship with Brother Joe that has allowed me to be able to go over to Ireland, for example, and minister with Jackie on both sides of the, of the wall, so to speak, you know. And uh, it's, uh, it's been great, so we thank God for that. But tonight we want to do a follow-up, the other side of the coin, so to speak. Amen. And uh, of this message on Christian unity, and really we're talking about the triune nature of God his word, man, and the church. So, uh, thank you, Curtis. Yes, I see that you put that up behind me. Thank you. If you could just, uh, we won't go through all the notes we went through last time. You can uh, go online and, and see that. And uh, this is our part two uh, that we want to share with you. And really, we're talking about the threefold things as it's been revealed by the Lord. The triune nature of God how it's revealed in creation, his word, man, and the church. You see here, I've put up a couple of examples. And um, <clears throat> particularly because we were talking about Ireland, the, the shamrock is, is a great one because really St. Patrick, who most people don't know, wasn't Irish, but he was English. <laughs> And the Irish used to slave the English, like the English later slaved the Irish and slaved uh, Africa and so on. But the Irish used to, back in the early 
time just after the Roman Empire was in Britain, the southern portion of Britain, uh, the, the Irish used to go over and enslave the northern parts of England, and uh, they had uh, Patrick as a young man taken away as a slave. And eventually he got free, and he went back home to England. And when he got home to England, he, he came to Christ and uh, found the Lord, and, uh, or the Lord found him, however you want to say it. And, uh, and he had a vision one night of the people in Ireland calling him to come back. It was almost like that Macedonian call that Paul had, you know, come over and help us, right? And, uh, and he returned uh, to Ireland, and this is what he used to describe God to the Irish people. And this is native plant, of course, to, to Ireland, is the shamrock or the three-leaf clover. And, uh, and he talked about the three in one, three leaves and one stem, right? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Praise God. And, uh, and really it was St. Patrick who coined the term the triune God. I don't tend to use the term Trinity. Some, there's nothing wrong with people who use the term Trinity. Uh, but I prefer to use the term that Patrick used, and that was the triune God, the three in one. Because it's not three separate plants, right? It's three leaves on one stem, three in one. The other illustration which uh, a lot of people, I know that uh, years ago we had Harold Chamberlain here uh, speaking here in the church, and Harold and uh, uh, his wife have been friends with uh, Pastor Tracy and I for years and years and years. And Harold was talking about uh, the egg, three in one. You know, this is the the, uh, yolk and the white and the shell. So we wanted to use a couple of examples that we see in creation, of God using uh, uh, three things, three in one. If we could come back to the notes now. Thank you, Brother Curtis, for doing all that. The triune nature of God, uh, creation, his word, man, and the church. See, I want you to understand that God doesn't just uh, do one thing in threes. He's doing everything in three, including the church. And we need to understand that and so that we have a, a good uh, understanding and revelation of this. So God's purpose is in three dimensions. And I hope to, you know, enlighten you a little bit by the power of the Holy Spirit on this tonight. I'm not going to obviously cover it all. You can perhaps find other uh, examples that you can share with me later on. But uh, let's just kind of go down through some of these notes here. So we, this is a follow-up. Uh, or the part two to our revelation on Christian unity. In Deuteronomy 16 and 16, it says this verse here. Uh, If you're able to see it where you are, just encourage you to read along with me. Um, Let's, there we are. Three times a year, all your males shall appear before the Lord. Uh, Okay, uh, that ran off the... Uh, No, no, that's okay. Lord your God, in the place which he chooses, at the feast of uh, unleavened bread, which is the feast of Passover, at the feast of weeks, which is the feast of Pentecost, that's coming up here, and the feast of tabernacles, and they shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed, right? This is Deuteronomy 16 and 16. So three times in a year uh, at that time, they were to appear, and of course, the three feasts, primary feasts that are mentioned there is the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is the Feast of Passover, and uh, the Feast of Weeks, which was 50 days or seven full weeks after uh, the Feast of Passover was the Feast of Pentecost. And that's why the scripture actually says in Acts chapter 2, when, it's, when, the, when Pentecost had fully come. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, that's the conclusion, the 50th day of the seven full weeks. And the Feast of Tabernacles, they shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed. Then we come to another verse that talks about threes. This is in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 12. And uh, it says, the one may be overpowered by another, and two can withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Ecclesiastes 4 and 12. A threefold cord. Have you ever 
I have found that if, if it's just a single cord, you can just snap it like that. But if you if it's braided like a rope is braided, you, it's not easy to break it. And the Bible is telling us a principle here about the importance of the threefold cord is not quickly broken. You know, one person can be overpowered. Uh, you know, uh, two can maybe withstand you, but. Three, it's, and this is the principle that Moses and Jesus and the Apostle Paul all used that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, this is not one passage that I'm going to refer to here, but it's a principle in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. Jesus in Matthew 28, 19 gives us the Great Commission. He says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now you'll notice here that he doesn't say names. It's not plural, it's singular. It's like the single stem with the three, three leaves on it of the shamrock. The name is singular. The name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Well, what's the name that's above all names? Jesus. That at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. Right. So the name of the Father and of Son and of the Holy Spirit, that is the name that is above every other name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Then we're going on down to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. We see here that uh, man is created in the image of God, right? Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit soul and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we see the, the triune nature of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and the triune nature of man, spirit, soul, and body. We are spirit, we have a soul, that's mind, will, and emotion, and we live in a body, amen? The spirit is made alive when we come to Christ, amen? Before that, we're a person operating in two dimensions. Two dimensions. You know, people that think they know it all, they've got a lot of academics and so on, but may not know Christ. They are simply operating in two dimensions. They're operating in soul and body. The spirit man hasn't made, been made alive. That's why Jesus said that unless you're born again, you cannot even see the kingdom of God. Right? If you want to see the kingdom of God, your spirit man needs to be made alive. The, and uh, you need to be born again by the spirit of God. So we're going to go down through, uh, I'm going to give you a list. Uh, it's not an, a, a complete list. You might come up with others. <laughs> That's fine. But uh, there's a list here. I'm going to go down through some triune reflections in the Bible, in God's Word, how things operate in three. You see, it's not just only God has a triune nature, man has a triune nature, uh, or creation has reflections of three, but also in the Word of God. Here's a, a graphic. Um, yeah, if you're able to expand that bit, Curtis, that's great. This, this was a parchment uh, graphic that I came across of the uh, Old Testament tabernacle. And you see the Old Testament tabernacle had the outer court, the holy place, and the holy of holies, or the most holy place, right? And uh, this is one of the, of the illustrations. This is really uh, Jesus in the Old Testament. This is a picture of the cross. We've got uh, graphics on the walls at the back door of the cross that runs through uh, the tabernacle, but I'm not here tonight to talk about that. I just want to throw that up to you, show you uh, a little bit of a graphic on that. Thank you, Curtis. And we'll just go back to the list now. I appreciate all your help there. Thank you, Curtis. So let me just kind of walk down through these, and maybe we'll make a few comments as we go along. In the in the tabernacle of witness that was in the wilderness, there was the outer court, the holy place, and the most holy place. It was prepared for all Israel. All the 12 tribes were around that, right? The camp was around. And it was for the priest. But it was only the high priest that could go once each year 
amen, into the most holy place or the holy of holies with the blood to put on the uh, mercy seat. Then we know that Jesus is not only our Savior, but he is the anointed one. He is Christ, and he is Lord. Amen. 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 And uh, we don't have time to go through scriptures on this, but Peter says that he is not, uh, that God has made Jesus, who he rose from the, raised from the dead, not only Christ, but Lord. Amen. And, G and Peter says that. I believe it's in the fourth chapter of Acts. We are born of the Spirit. We have the first fruits of the Spirit in our life, and we enter into the fullness of the Spirit. We are born in air. We have the earnest of our inheritance, which is the Holy Spirit, and we enter into full possession or maturity in the things of the Spirit. We are born babies. We walk as children, and we grow up to be adults, both naturally and spiritually. Uh, we have the new birth in Christ. We enter into the Holy Ghost baptism and grow up to be uh, mature or maturity in God. We are little children, young men, and become fathers. We're coming to Father's Day here, and that's natural and spiritual as well. Justification, sanctification, glorification. Big terms, but they're all principles that we see in the Word of God. We have the milk of the Word, the bread of the Word, and the meat of the Word. Amen? Praise God. We have 30-fold. Jesus talked about, you know, the seed that is sown will bring forth fruit. Six, a 30-fold, 60-fold, and a 100-fold. We have the Feast of Passover. We just read the scripture from Deuteronomy 16 and 16 on that. The Feast of Passover, the Feast of Pentecost, the Feast of Tabernacles. We have baptism in water, baptism in the Spirit, baptism in fire. Our spirit, man, is saved when we come to Christ, okay? But the soul is being saved, you know, with the transforming, renewing of our minds. The scripture talks about in Romans chapter 12. And ultimately, when the Lord comes, our body shall be saved. We'll get that resurrection body. Amen? Amen. There's a common salvation, a great salvation, and eternal salvation that's referred to in the Word of God. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. We were formed of the dust of the ground, and, and God spoke to Abraham and said, Can you number the sand of the sea or the stars in the heavens? Right? Right? We have faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. Amen. Amen. We come with thanksgiving. We enter into praise and worship. We have Jesus, who is our prophet, priest, and king. Amen. We have the sons of Heber who are the Hebrews, amen? And uh, natural Israel was the result of that. Abraham was a Hebrew. He wasn't a Jew, right? The Jews came from Judah, right? Abraham was a Hebrew. Uh, so we have natural Israel, and ultimately those who come through Jesus Christ make up the Israel of God. Paul talks about that in Galatians chapter 6. We have the Jews, the Gentiles, and the Christians. We've seen in the scriptures as well. I am the temple. How many of you know that little course? No, you're not. No, you're not. I am the temple. I'm the temple of the Holy Ghost. Amen. So we have the temple. We have the local church. And we have the whole body of Christ. We are born of the Spirit. Jesus said, with two or three of you are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst. And we have the Lamb's wife, the bride of Christ. Amen? Amen. We walk, we run, we mount up with wings as eagles. Amen? We have natural light, artificial light, and divine light from heaven. Amen? Jesus is the light of the world. Fruit, more fruit, and much fruit. Amen? We have the birthright, the blessing, and the inheritance. Jesus the babe, Jesus the youth, and Jesus the man. Amen? Amen. Jesus is not a baby anymore. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Out of Egypt. They came out of Egypt. They went into the wilderness and then into the land. We have in Matthew 25 the story of the foolish virgins, the wise virgins, and the watchmen. Amen. David's first anointing happened by the prophet Samuel at Jesse's house. When he was out in the field, and the Jesse said, uh, Samuel says to Jesse, 
you know, uh, Pastor Tracy did a ladies' uh, conference, uh, Fill Your Horn With Oil and Go, I think it was called, right? All about that whole story. And uh, Samuel tells Jesse, there's one more. There's one more. Where is this boy? And Jesse said, well, I got one son. He's the youngest one. He's out there taking care of the sheep. Oh, get him in here. And he anoints him as king over Israel. But that was just the beginning. The second anointing happened um, in uh, he was it Hebron. Uh, didn't happen. The third one happened in Jerusalem, but the second one happened in in, in uh, Judea, Judah, uh, part of there. Sorry. Yeah, no, it wasn't. It was just the part of. Of Judah, and uh, then the third anointing happened as king over all of Israel, right? So there's a greater dimension that you're entering into. That's the point that we're trying to say. There's gleanings, the harvest, and the first fruits. There's divine healing, divine health, and divine life. Amen? Amen. Uh, the story of Ruth there was Orpha, the other sister in law, and Ruth and Naomi. So there's Orpha, Naomi, and Ruth. And Ruth, of course, became the grandmother of David, right? Ruth married Boaz, right? And she became the grandmother, I believe, of David. Praise God, through whom Jesus came. We know that we were, uh, Eve is the mother of us all, right? But it was through Sarah that the seed came, Isaac. It's through Isaac that you shall be blessed, the scripture says. And ultimately, Mary, and Joe's family knows all about that whole story, right? Because they really recognize Mary. Acknowledge that Mary, it was Mary that was blessed of the Lord to carry the, the Jesus, right? So we are brass vessels, silver vessels, and gold vessels. We see that in the scriptures. We are workers, warriors, and worshipers. Ah, amen. Uh, are you a worshiper tonight? We see that there are 12 disciples. And then Jesus takes three disciples up to the Mount of Transfiguration. He leaves nine behind. And ultimately, uh, Peter, James, and John get to go with them up to the top of the mountain, don't they? Amen. We have little faith, great faith, and all faith. We have the first heaven, second heaven, and third heaven. We have the threshing floor, Mount Moriah, and Mount Zion. Amen. We have the remnant of her seed, the sun-clothed woman and the man-child that we read about in the book of Revelation. We are sealed with the circumcision of water baptism. We are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And we're sealed with the mind of Christ in the forehead. We have natural families, spiritual families, and the family of God. We're born again. We are a new creation. Amen. We are a child of God. Amen? We have the Spirit, the water, and the blood. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. The spirit, the water, and the blood. Now, here's a list, and tonight we're going to kind of focus on the blood of Jesus as we come to a conclusion here in a few minutes. But uh, that's a, a list. It's not a complete list, but it's a list of... Do you, can, can you see that, that there's a reflection of, of triune or three threes throughout the, the Word of God, right? Amen. Amen. Praise God. So let's carry on. In John chapter 3, verse 3, talking about threes, Jesus, talking to Nicodemus, he answered and he said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So we are born of the Spirit. We need to be born of the Spirit. Amen. Uh, again, in chapter 3, verse 7, Jesus says, Marvel not that I say that you must be born again. Uh, Peter says in 1 Peter 1 and 23, Being born not of corruptible seed, but of the incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Praise God. Let me just uh, take a quick look here at my notes to make sure I haven't... Uh, missed anything extra because sometimes on my notes I write little extra things that uh, we're going to look at a couple of extra little cross references here that I don't have on the screen uh, in just a moment to give you a, a, a little bit fuller picture. Now we mentioned uh, about uh, local churches are like spiritual families when we were going down through that list you'll remember 
that we mentioned this verse. Jesus said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. So Jesus mentions the importance of assembly. Jesus mentions the importance of agreement. In fact, in another verse he says, if two of you agree as touching anything, it shall be done. In other words, the power of agreement when you pray together with somebody else in the name of Jesus. In the book of Ephesians, chapter 3, uh, especially in the English Standard Version, it makes this rendition of this verse. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father fr from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. So we said this earlier, know you not, know you not, you are the temple, you are the temple of the Holy Ghost. You receive Christ into your life. But when we gather together like this, we are the local fellowship, the local church assembled, right? Like Jesus said, where two or three of you gather together, or the uh, family on earth. We are a f spiritual family on earth. But there are families in heaven too. Okay? So what Jesus, what the Word of God is, is showing here is that we're talking about threefold. I am the temple. We are the body of Christ, the local expression of the body of Christ, the local church, and there is the universal body of Christ. But the universal body of Christ is not just the church in Newmarket. It's not just the church on planet Earth. It's the church in heaven and on earth. Okay? Now, a lot of people don't capture that. They don't understand that the universal church is both on heaven, in heaven and earth. So Pastor Mark and Evelyn and Sister Elizabeth and Arnold and all these people that have been here with us are still part of the universal church. They're in heaven tonight. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Worshiping God. And then we talked about local churches when we did this more extensively. There's 34 or 35 uh, scriptures that uses the plural form of churches, the importance of churches throughout the uh, New Testament. Now, we're not going to go through that whole list. It's in the first session that we did, but we're going to look at a few of them here. It says he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Listen, if it wasn't important for the churches to be strengthened, he wouldn't have done it. He would have said, forget about the churches. You are the temple. Don't you know that? Go do your own thing. But he didn't do that. He said it's important to strengthen the churches. Look at Romans 16 and 16. Greet one another with the holy kiss. The churches of Christ greet you. Oh, you mean the churches belong to Christ? Yes. They're part of the plan, purpose, the threefold revelation of God. Know you not that you are the temple the local church and the universal church. Okay? The universal church. The whole body of Christ in heaven and on earth. Praise God. Okay? Second Corinthians 8 and 18. And we have sent with him the brother who pr whose praise is in the gospel throughout all the churches. You see, it's important for people to have a good uh, testimony. Good testimony. See, the brother whose praise is in the gospel throughout all the churches. Uh, I think it's a possibility that it was Apollos, but I'm not really sure. I don't have the whole context here in front of me. But, we, uh, but anyway, the point being is that this particular brother had a good testimony amongst all of the churches. We need to have uh, a good testimony, right? A good testimony. Let's carry on. Uh, verse 19. And not only that, but who was also chosen by the churches to travel with us with this gift, which is administered by us to the glory of the Lord himself and to show your ready mind. You mean to say that churches need to make choices and have leadership decisions? Yes. Yes. Scripture says so. They were, he was chosen by the churches. 
In other words, it wasn't just some sort of whim of the Holy Ghost that, you know, like somebody thinks, oh, it was the Spirit of God that sent me over here. No, no. They were chosen by the churches because the churches recognized that he had a good testimony. Right? So this is important to understand these principles. We don't have time to break it all down, but you can see who was also chosen by the churches to travel with us with this gift. Okay, let's carry on. Galatians 1, verse 2. And all the brethren who are with us to the churches of Galatia. It's not one church in the area of Galatia. It's all the churches, plural, in Galatia. Amen. Maybe we could just have the air on there for a couple of minutes there, just uh, so we all stay awake. Okay, great. Revelation chapter 2, verse 29. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Oh, you mean to say that the Holy Spirit is speaking to all the churches? Yes. 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 He's not just speaking to the church. Universal church. Know you not, you are the temple. How many of you know you can be led by the Holy Spirit? Amen? So are the churches being led by the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is speaking to the churches. Plural. Right? And, of course, to the whole body, the universal church. Praise God. Also, Revelation 22 and 16, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the the churches I am the root and offspring of David the bright and morning star so Jesus sent his angel you know you know what if Jesus said oh it's just all the universal church all you little churches just all get together under the same roof he didn't say that he said you are so distinctly diverse and important I'm going to send my angel to testify to each and individual church these things. Hello. Hello. You know, a lot of people don't want to recognize that, but that's what the Word of God says. So we're talking about now the whole family of God, the body of Christ or the bride of Christ. Again, there's three things, the family of God, the body or the bride, depending on how you want to look at it. This universal church is on both sides of the present reality and eternity. Present reality. So we are born again, we are part of the local church, and we are part of the universal church. We see those threefold revelations like the, like the, uh, the yolk, the white, and the, and the shell of the egg, right? Okay. Again, coming back to Ephesians chapter 3. Now, this is the New King James Version of this uh, verse. It says, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and in earth is named. The whole family. The whole family. Okay? So we're talking about being born again, the local church, and the whole family, the whole universal church. And where is the whole family? Is it just on earth? Heaven and earth. Yeah, heaven, and earth. heaven and earth. Right. So again, you're seeing the threefold reflection. Be individually, collectively, and heaven and earth. Heaven and earth. Praise God. Okay, let's carry on. 1 Corinthians 10, 16. Paul says, the cup of blessing which we bless is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break is it not the communion of the body of Christ? So we have the communion of the blood and the communion of the body. Amen? We are broken. There's broken. It's individual and it's collective. Right? It's communion. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually in other words you're individually unique and distinct yeah. right right but you're also part of the whole body all right Ephesians 4 and 12 that it's for the the this is talking about the the ministry gifts all right the ascension gifts 
are for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying or the building up of the body of Christ. Revelation 21 and 2. Then I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Right? So this is the whole body. Again, Revelation 21, 9. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came to me and talked with me, saying, Come, and I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. And the spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him who, has, uh, who hears say, Come, and let him who thirsts come, and whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. So in conclusion uh, here tonight, we want to talk about our life. You know, the life is in the spirit, the water, and the blood. These three agree, right? And we want to focus really on the blood tonight because life is in the blood. Amen. 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 We come as believers. We, uh, if we are believers, we are the children of God and we are part of the family of God. So the scripture says in John chapter 1 verse 12, but as many, but as many as received him, that's Christ, to them he gave the right to become the children of God to those who believe in his name. Now, just before we get into all of this on the blood, I just had a couple of uh, references. I, you know, the Lord always does this to me when I put stuff up, or give stuff to Curtis and he puts it up there and then all of a sudden I get these cross references that come. But at any rate, I thought this, this was kind of interesting. Uh, I just got to throw it out there for, for you to munch on. Talking about uh, being part of the family of God. Jesus happened to send out 70 disciples. Do you know that? He sent out 70 disciples. How did he send them? He sent them two by two, right? And he sent them out to go out and minister. Uh, in Luke's Gospel, chapter 10, verse 7. Luke's Gospel, chapter 10, verse 7. He tells them to go, and he says, If a house receives you, stay in that house. In other words, if you're received there. And I thought, you know, there's an interesting parallel with people who come into the church, right? They need to be planted, and they need to learn to stay there until, the, you know, if they happen, their life happens to change, you know, they, they have to move away because of job or family or situation. Or so, so that, you know, life changes, you know, these things happen. We get older, <laughs> get more gray hair or lose hair, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> things happen, all right? But uh, let's look at this verse here. And in the same house remain. Jesus telling his 70 disciples, in the same house remain eating and drinking such things as they give for the laborer is worthy of his hire go not from house to house now we've all seen people who bounce in here and bounce on to the next place but Jesus actually teaches against that he says go not from house to house. Stay in the same house, remain there, eating and drinking such things as they give. And in other words, as long as you're welcome there, stay there. As long as you, you know, are able to do it, do it. All right, let me give you another reference. I'm just throwing this out for you to, to think about because, you know, I came across these verses after I had put the notes together. Same principle, uh, talking about sending out the 70, two by two, right? Matthew chapter 10, verse 11. Matthew chapter 10, verse 11. And in Matthew's account, he says, stay there till you go out of the house. In other words, don't go out of the house. Stay in the house. So here we are. Let's read this. And into whatsoever city or town you shall enter, inquire who in it is worthy. In other words, where do you feel welcome, right? And there abide till you go 
thence. Or if, if, is it possible that the New King James? It might be a little bit more, a little more uh, readable um, for some of us simple people. <laughs> Praise God. If it's too difficult, don't worry. We'll pa we'll ca you got it? There we are. Okay, we're going to Matthew 10. Matthew 10, verse 11. There we are. Now, whatever city or town you enter, inquire who in it is worthy and stay there till you go out. In other words, don't go, uh, the other scripture uh, says in Luke 10 and 7, do not go from house to house. Don't go jumping around from place to place. Be planted, in other words. Be planted. And, uh, but you see, a lot of people don't understand these principles, but I'm just sharing these with you so that the Holy Spirit can do his own work in your heart as you take the word of God as the seed and let the seed uh, bear forth fruit unto God. Okay, we're going to go back to uh, the notes there now. Here in John 1 and 13, it says, talking about those who are children of God, to those who believe in his name, who are born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. How many of you know we need to be born of God? Amen? Amen. 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 Praise God. So let's carry on. In Leviticus 17:11 it says, "For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement for the souls." How many of you know that the blood of Jesus made atonement for the soul? Amen. Amen. The blood of Jesus made atonement for the soul, and life is in the blood. So we're going to conclude by going down through a list of 20 things, 20 things here. The blood of Christ does for his children. Amen. Now this is up on the website. If you want to use it, you can. Not all of this is original with me. Okay, I'm just being honest. But uh, uh, some of the things I got from Kelly Varner, some I got from other people. But the scriptures speak for themselves, I think, right? So the first one is that the blood of Jesus remits sins. Hey, right? It it remits sins. So here it is in Matthew 26 and 28. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Right? He remits sins. He removes them. All right? Secondly, the blood. It gives life to those who consume it. Right? We're talking about John chapter 6, verse 53. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. That's pretty powerful. You need to be a partaker of the blood and the flesh of the Lord. Amen. All right, Acts. Uh, so that's, that's, uh, oh, that's, the second one, right. The third one is the blood of Jesus causes us to dwell in Christ and he in us. From John chapter 6, verse 56. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. Amen. 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 So, praise God. The blood of Jesus causes us to dwell in Christ and he in us. Praise God. Hallelujah. All right. The fourth thing that the blood of Christ does, let me just ask you, how are you all feeling? Comfortable? Everybody's comfortable? Okay. The fourth thing is that the blood of Christ, it is the means by which Jesus purchased the church. He purchased the church by his blood. Okay. Acts 20, verse 28. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Amen? He purchased it with his own blood. All right. Fifthly, the blood of Jesus we're talking about. It is the means by which Jesus becomes our atonement through faith. Right? 
It's the means through which Jesus becomes our atonement through faith. Romans chapter 3, verse 25. We could, yeah, thank you, Curtis. Okay, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. In other words, in the Old Testament, the blood of bulls and goats did not remove sin, it just covered it. Just covered it. Have you ever seen something which looks dirty and you just kind of throw something over it to cover it up? But you need cleaner to actually remove it out of there, right? Well, his blood is righteous. Amen? And you receive that through faith. Amen? Amen. So God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness. Amen. Amen. Sixthly, his blood. It justifies us and saves us from wrath. It's the blood of Jesus that saves us from wrath. Amen. Amen. So uh, here we are, Romans chapter 5, verse 9. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath wrath through him. Amen. You want to get saved from the wrath of God? You got to be covered in the blood. Amen. Washed in the blood. Redeemed by the blood. Amen. Praise God. Amen. There is. Amen. Hallelujah. The seventh point about the blood of Jesus is it redeems us. This is Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Amen. We have redemption. I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Saved and sanctified I am. All my sins are under the blood. I've been redeemed. And that's not all. There's more beside. And that's not all. There's more beside. And that's not all. There's more beside. I've been to the river and I've been baptized. All my sins are under the blood. I've been redeemed. Thank God for redemption. Amen? Amen. The water, the spirit, and the blood. These three agree. Amen. 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 Are you thankful for the blood? Amen. All right. All right. Also, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19, it says... Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by traditions from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Amen. So we were redeemed. Amen. Amen. Not with corruptible things. You can't buy it with silver or gold. Amen. But with the precious blood of Christ. Amen. Praise God. We want to carry on here. Revelation chapter 5 verse 9. And they sing a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Amen. Praise God. Amen. We've been redeemed. Number eight, the blood of Jesus that brings those who are far away from God near to him. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus you were once far, awa- far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Jesus. Amen. The blood of Christ has brought us near to God. Amen. Amen. The ninth thing is the blood of Jesus. It grants us the forgiveness of sins. You only have forgiveness of sins because of the blood. Amen. 
in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Amen. The blood of Jesus, tenthly, it brings peace and reconciliation to God. Colossians 1 and 20. And by him to reconcile all things to himself by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Hallelujah. Thank God for the cross. Amen. Praise God. Number 11, the blood of Jesus. It has obtained eternal redemption for us. Hallelujah. Amen. This is from Hebrews 9 and 12. Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once and for all, having obtained eternal redemption. You see, we were talking about the tabernacle in the Old Testament, you know, the outer court, the holy place, the most holy place. But here it says that he has entered into the most holy place once and for all. Amen. Having obtained eternal redemption. Number 12. The blood of Jesus cleanses our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Hebrews 9 and 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Number 13. The blood of Jesus, it is the means by which we enter the most holy place with boldness. Hebrews 10 and 19. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus. That's the only way you can enter into the most holy place is by the blood of Jesus. Amen. Praise God. Number 14. Uh, it speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Hebrews 12 and 24, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Number 15, the blood of Jesus, it sanctifies us. Therefore, Jesus also, this is from Hebrews 13 and 12, therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood suffered outside the gate. Number 16, the blood of Jesus, it makes us complete for every good work. This is from Hebrews chapter 13, verses 20 and 21. Now may the God of peace, who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever Amen. Praise God. Number 17, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. Praise God. 1 John 1, 7, for if we walk in the light, to see us in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Amen. Praise God. Number 18, the blood of Jesus bears witness in earth along with the spirit and the water. John chapter, 1 John chapter 5, verse 8. And there are three that bear witness on earth, the spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree as one. Praise God. We're talking about the triune nature of God. Praise God. Number 19. The blood of Jesus, it is the means by which Jesus washes us. Praise God. Are you glad you're washed in the blood of the Lamb? Amen. Revelation 1 and 5, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Also, Revelation 7 and 14, and I said to him, Sir, you know. So he said to me, these are the ones who came out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And number 20, the blood of Jesus. It is the means by which we overcome the accuser of the brethren. Revelation 12 and 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. Amen. So in summary tonight, we thank God for the precious blood of Christ, the sprinkled blood of Christ, the blood of the new covenant, and the blood of the eternal covenant. Amen. 
1 Peter 1 and 19, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Hebrews 12 and 24, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkled that speaks better things than that of Abel. Luke 22 and 20, likewise he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Hebrews 13 and 20, now may the God of peace who brought us our Lord Jesus from the dead, the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant, and finally, Leviticus 17 and 11, which tells us, we read this earlier, for the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. What blood are they prophesying about here? Jesus. It's prophesying about Jesus' blood. Amen. And it is the blood of Jesus that makes atonement for your souls. There is no other way. There is no other blood. Amen. So in conclusion here tonight, it's three minutes to ten. So let me just conclude with three little points here. Do you want this life through the blood of Jesus today? Amen. You can have it by asking him, Lord Jesus, come into my heart and be Lord of my life. We need to cry out, call upon him with all of our heart and soul right now in Jesus' name. You can become a partaker of the threefold revelation of God today. Today. Remember this. We started off with this tonight. The threefold revelation of God. God is a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He has formed us, and we are spirit we have a soul, and we live in a body. Amen? We went through about four, between 40 and 50 triune revelations of God that are in his word. We saw a couple of examples of threefold things seen in creation, like the shamrock leaf, three leaves on one stem, or the egg, the yolk, the white, and the shell. And also, we see that the church is a threefold creation of God. Amen. All right? We are, know you not, you are the temple. And then, 35 references of churches, local churches in the New Testament. Churches are the next expression of Jesus said, where two or three you gather together, there am I in the midst. And finally, the universal church. The universal church we saw was not just on earth, but also in heaven, right? Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. So, Lord Jesus, we thank you tonight that we have this threefold revelation of God. And, Lord, I pray, Father, that you help us to understand, Lord, that you are triune, and you've made us in your image. You have made creation in your image. The word of God is in your image. The church of Jesus Christ is in his image. And Lord, I pray that we will begin to recognize that and walk in that revelation now in the mighty name of Jesus. I thank you, Lord Jesus, as we've gone through these 20 points about how our life is in the blood, the water, the spirit, and the blood, these three agree. Lord, I thank you for the blood of Jesus.